Hi everyone, uh, I'm Duncan. Uh, this is my first time giving a technical talk in about 10 years, literally. So uh, cut me some slack, please. Uh, I've, I've been playing around with Meteor quite a lot and I found that every time I really understood particular topics and features of the language in more depth, it actually vastly improved um, what I was able to deliver and kind of led to a bit of refactoring, learning from my mistakes. Uh, I want to cover a, basically a couple of those topics on that. So one is around the uh, use of the transform function and the other is around uh, eJSON, which I kind of regard as being fairly similar to each other. Um, I'll try and explain that. Because it's the first time in about 10 years as well, I'm not going to do any kind of live coding stuff, but I've got a bunch of stuff. I, here's one I've made earlier. Uh, and I'll, what I'll do is I'll try to walk you through and show how the concepts have been applied through a very, very simplistic example, uh, which is kind of derived from something that I did that was far more complicated. Um, so, you know, really, it's it's around um, being able to reuse your code and uh, basically create a model that um, is shared between the back end and the front end. So uh, I guess you know, kind of MVC is a sort of common term, whether you call it a framework or a principle uh, that's used in, in development. Meteor does really have those kind of capabilities, but it's maybe not uh, that wonderful at showing off those capabilities. So just so I know, kind of know what sort of speed to go at. Uh, can you please raise your hands if you've used the transform function with, on a collection in Meteor before? Like seriously, the more people that raise their hands, the quicker I'm going to go through it. So if you have, then I don't want to have to regurgitate something you already know. Okay, so I'm going with a handful. So I'm, I'm going to spend um, uh, a little bit of time on that then and show how it works. So, you know, again, I'm, I may get some of the terminology wrong and a little bit out of practice on this, but generally speaking, what the transform function allows you to do is take your regular old objects that are coming out of your Mongo environment and en route model them more as proper objects. Uh, so I've got a couple of links and I'm, I'm going to, I've already stuck this on the slide share, so you can have a look at the links and um, you know, it's in the official documents, and then there's another link there for you know quite a kind of good step-by-step -step example. Um, and the way you typically use it is you uh, define the transform function on your collection, typically creating a uh, new object. You take whatever's come out of your Mongo uh, document, and you use that to extend the object, basically add on all the properties. And then once you've done that, you can you can then basically further extend the prototype of that object in JavaScript with additional properties, uh, more likely to be functions or methods, whichever your uh, preferred parlance is. Now that's all the kind of theoretical stuff. So what does it really look like um, in practice? So can you everyone see? Do I need to make it even bigger? We don't have like a proper projector. So those at the back, hands up, can read. Awesome. Um, so there, this is just to say, you know, just so you know, on the packages, I took away the insecure package, but I've left the auto-publish package just so that kind of everything gets thrown to the client. Um, so then, let me uh, start by saying, okay, so all I've got is, uh, this is my base template, and I'm inserting another template called play. Um, and so, what I've done, if I, so, the, so the basic premise here is uh, I've got kind of a hierarchy that I'm going to be going through. So my base collection is a game, uh, I chose something that everyone's kind of familiar with, it's a game. Within a game you have uh, any number of teams, and within the teams you have any number of players. And a game can't start until you have at least two teams and at least one player in each team. Okay, fairly, fairly simple, straightforward kind of concept. 
All right, so, so if I click the create game button, uh, that basically has uh, just a uh, pretty simple. It's, it's called the method on the back end to create a new game, which all it does is say, you insert a very simple document at this stage, right? So there's no teams, it's basically completely empty. All right, now, this is where it hopefully starts to get a little bit more interesting. So you see that although all I've done is insert the document, I've actually got more information. Now obviously I've got the ID that's also generated when I stuck it into the database. Uh, but I also know how many teams there are and how many players there are and whether or not I'm ready. So how's that, how's that actually coming about? Well, so this is where um, you know, Meteor's magic really starts to come in. So firstly, within the, the table that I'm just declared, so I've said for each games, so games is uh, a very simple handler, just says find all the games. Okay, great, so all I'm doing is pulling out whatever games that are in the database through this. So nothing, it shouldn't have any kind of funny stuff going on. But by doing that, now I've got a Teams, but I can actually, because Teams is an array, uh, directly within uh, space bars through Meteor's Blaze component, I'm able to uh, chain that property. So being an array, it has a length property. So I'm directly displaying the property, and that's what gives me this value here. Okay? So simplest form of modeling. Right? No, I've not actually used anything funky at this stage, but I've been able to um, recognize that within my, um, within my each, so my each is for all the games. By calling games, I basically set the data context within this block will be whichever game is being looped through. So I don't need to, you know, I could do like this.teams.length, but it won't make any difference. It automatically infers what this is within the current data context. So I can not only uh, represent one property, you know, which would show it as an array, but I can actually use chaining to, uh, to pull out the length property. All right. So then, that's all I good. Um, but then I've also got this thing called play account, um, which is also telling me I've got zero players in my game. No surprise there. Um, but if I look at where's that coming from you can see actually that's not included in my helpers my helpers are game selected game and selected teams so i've got play account but play account wasn't if i go back to my insert it was it wasn't something i inserted in the database it's not a property so where where on earth does that property come from um, and the answer is that that's where the transform function comes in so when, normally when you declare a collection, it looks something like this, right? Everyone custom to do that. You're also able to pass it a function. And that function is a transform. Uh, you, you can pass it several things actually, but a transform is uh, one of the functions you can define on a collection. And that takes uh, a document as its input to the function, and then you can do whatever you want with it. So basically, for every document that is pulled out of MongoDB, it will run it through this transform function, and instead of returning uh, the document when you say games.find, it actually returns whatever the result of the transform function is. So in this instance, I've told it to return a new game. So what's that? How does that make any sense? Okay. So this is where you know stuck things in the model folder here. So this is where it gets, I, I think Meteor gets really pretty awesome. Okay, so my model folder is uh, something that I'm sharing between my back end and my front end. Yeah, this is where the whole isomorphic uh, JavaScript comes into effect. So my constructor, as I kind of mentioned, just says, okay, take the document and then 
when I'm creating the object, just use the underscore library. Uh, underscore is completely integrated in Meteor. It's one of the uh, underscores in jQuery they kind of guarantee will work. Um, and just extend it with whatever the document had. Okay, so that means I know when I put the document in, I had start and team. So yeah, my games object should have those two properties, but it still hasn't got this uh, player count. So where's that coming in? So okay, so now I can also extend the prototype of that object as well with whatever I want. So at the point of pulling a record out of the database, I can basically go from being a DOM, uh, effectively JSON string, and now make it into a proper object complete with additional properties and uh, methods and anything else I want to add. And that's basically what I did. So I've, I've created a function, uh, I've called it play account, it extends the game object, and by doing so, I basically modeled this on the back end. Sorry, I'm, a, I'm more of a back end than a front end guy if you haven't worked it out. I've modeled this on the back end. It comes out of my database when it's been called for it, runs it through a transform function, turns it into an object, and then it's available on the front end. So on my front end, I refer directly in spacebars. Um, to that function, and spacebars will basically can handle. You know, here, for example, this is actually a property. Uh, here, it's a function. It doesn't matter which. You don't need the uh, sort of brackets afterwards to execute the function. It'll do it automatically. Uh, you can chain properties and and or functions, or properties and functions. And so, if uh, play account returns an array, I could do play account dot length, and it would know to execute it and then uh, return the length property. So. Uh, the, the really important thing is here is what I've not done, which is what I naively did when I first started using Meteor, I've not defined this as a template helper. So I've not told my front end to go examine the object uh, to run some kind of function. Rather, I've defined it once in, my, in my, more of my back end in my model environment. And now, wherever I want anywhere in my front end, I can call play account. But because it's also not a template helper, I can also call it on my back end. I can call it in my methods. And so it's, it's now available to me anywhere I want to read the data that's coming out of the database. I've basically taken Mongo, which is a, a document store, and I've basically turned it into an object, uh, sort of uh, object model database. Um, so then just, uh, just some sort of things around this. Uh, this, uh, what you extend the um, uh, the object you return, sorry, is uh, it's not reactive. Okay, so anything that's going to drive Meteor's reactivity is going to be a change in the database. It's not going to be a change in a sort of a calculated property. Right. So, um, you know, if if I decided to extend my game prototype with um, some properties that I'd calculated um, at, uh, at point of extraction, if for whatever reason that calculation changed without the data in the database changing, that calculation would not be rerun. Okay. So that, that's a very important point, which means that generally speaking, you're not going to be um, extending your prototype with properties, uh, unless those properties are directly derived from the data, and those properties will, uh, and any change in the data will uh, cause that property to change. Because then you change the data, the reactivity will kick in, a new record will be driven through, it'll go through the transform again, new object, and push back. Um, but if that if that property can be changed through other means, that's not going to that's not going to drive any reactivity. Uh, what it means though is it does make it very very good for uh, adding on of methods, uh, adding on of functions that are uh, used to calculate or infer things from existing properties within the database. Okay, so it's really really good for that. Uh, as in this, so this uh, <coughs> this kind of play account. So that's 
Uh, that's really where the transform function comes in. Uh, this allows me to uh, to determine that and run a function that gives me this. Uh, it also tells me that it's you know I'm not ready to play yet because I don't have um, I don't have at least two teams and I don't have uh, and every team is not ready now. That's the kind of second part of the talk I'm about to jump onto. Uh, so at this point, you can see I've also taken. Uh, sorry if you're not like big on functional programming and underscores and all that sort of stuff. Uh, basically, what this says is I've reduced uh, the number of players to a to a single value um, by going through all of the uh, all of the teams and taking. Uh, the size of the player's property from that team. Okay, so remember we've got a game team players. At the moment there aren't any players so by definition that's, that's not going to return me anything meaningful. Okay. So that's that's the transform side of things. So basically you've got this really cool way of Pullings, when something reactively gets pulled out of the MongoDB backend, you've now turned it into a proper object and you're able to use it as an object in your backend and in your front end. That's where that isomorphic code really comes in. You know, it's from an MVC perspective, that's the bit where people who are more front end developers should be saying, hang on, this is, uh, this is like something that is known for the object, this is common, this should be pushed into my model and delivered on the back end. I shouldn't be continually redeveloping this on the front end. Uh, you know, you can have helpers that uh, span all templates rather than being template specific, but you know, even better is if you don't need to do that, you push everything into the model environment. Uh, especially things, if you find yourself reusing things on the front end, basically redoing the same uh, calculations on an object or on a, on a document, probably the best thing is to look at, use the transform function basically attach that to the document, then you can just call it directly. Uh, the whole point is you know, you're not repeating yourself, you're uh, defining it once and then you're reusing it everywhere. Um, and, and these are things that are very model centric. So if you've got a calculated value, that's really something that is inherent in the data, but it doesn't have anything to do with defining how that view is displayed to the, uh, to the end user. Okay. So that's the first part. Let's uh, transform. So I'll pause at this point before I jump into eJSON, which I see as kind of like the big brother to a transform function. Uh, any questions at this stage? Okay, I really hope I'm explaining myself because it's, it's a tricky topic to, uh, to cover. Okay, so eJSON, also, it, it's part of the uh, standard functionality. It's, it's, it's in the Meteor documents, you can find uh, all about it. Um, put super simply, eJSON pretty much does the same thing as a transform, or that's kind of how it's set up to do that, that's how I see it. Um, but rather than acting at the level of a document, I see it as acting at the level of a property. So uh, for example, if in my nice little games environment, um, if I had you know, one game for like the game of Go and another game for the game of chess, I've probably got teams in both those game documents and I might well want to define the teams in exactly the same way. So using eJSON, basically I can do that. I can say, you know, this is, uh, this is how a teams object behaves. Uh, with respect to the database, so I can then uh, get a level of reusability um, out of that, particularly with respect to uh, some of its methods and some of its functions. So it's not at the document level. So transform's really good at doing it at the document level. eJSON's really good at kind of doing these things at the level below the document when you're really looking at the property. Um, but it's a bit more complicated to do. So if I then jump back, so. Here's 
an example of where I've actually used it. So to determine whether the game game's ready and whether all the teams are ready, I'm looking at do I have at least two teams? And then I also I've also got this thing here. So I'm basically saying is every team ready? But that that's not a property, that's not like a length count. I'm actually just called a function um, or a method on a team that it doesn't look like I actually ever defined, um, but I did. Um, so at this point, I think I can jump into to my Mongo, I think. So I've only, remember I've only created like um, a very simplistic game when I inserted it into the back end, right? So this is all I've had. Um, so that's all you can see at the back end of this stage. But what I'm going to do now, if I can. So if I select this. Oh, by the way, like for the front end, I'm using the materialize package, which basically like gives you all the front end for Google's material design stuff. It's really nice. I recommend that. Because um, basically, I didn't have to code anything on the front end because I'm rubbish at that. Um, so then. Add a team. So now I've added the team Nitrous, and as we know, there's no players in there yet. Um, so then let me do the back end. So when I've added a team, uh, again, all I've done is I've updated my games object for the game that we already had selected, and I'm setting teams equivalent to uh, the game game teams. okay so all I did for that is I created a new team I gave it a name I pushed it onto my originally empty teams array and then I updated the database um, so just to kind of prove on that um, yeah, that's the kind of constructor as it were for the team all it takes is a name, and then it's got now created an empty array of players because I didn't tell any players to push in. Um, but then, when I look at what's been pushed into Mongo, sorry, can you zoom in? When, when you look at what's in the database, uh, this is the game's document, it's not been started as Teams, but rather than storing it um, just like this, as you might expect, you know, as a, so you can see there's, there's an array, but it, within that array I don't just have a standard serialized JSON object with a name and players. Um, I've got these funny kind of EJSON things that have come in and go, okay, so kind of what, what's going on there? Uh, and that's basically the naming convention that Meteor is using in the interaction with Mongo when it pushes it in to say, I'm not pushing in a normal property, I'm pushing in uh, any JSON property. Okay, I haven't shown you how it knows that's any JSON property, which is what I'm about to do. But that's how it kind of looks. That's how it ends up in the database, you end up with this funny kind of naming convention. I mean, it's not that hard to work out exactly what's gone out. Um, so, what, so again, what happened, to, to be able to do that, um, I need to have uh, these two functions uh, as available on the, on the object, on the object that I've pushed in. So remember, you know, I actually created it as a new object here. So because it's an object, it's got those functions at the point that I'm uh, that I pushed it into the array, and at the point I uh, sent it into the into the database. So because it's got those functions, Meteor can basically look at those and go, "Aha! Those special predefined functions are there. 
that means it's an JSON object. I need to do something special with it. Um, so they're not that complicated, honestly. So the easiest one is the type name. Okay, so what's what's my unique name for this JSON object? So this needs to basically be a unique name. You're um, you're defining a custom type at this point. So as a custom type, you obviously can't use standard names. That would just be silly. And you also want to make sure there's no kind of namespace conflicts and things like that. So, um, and that you can see has actually ended up here. That's what it's called it when it's pushed into the database. So that tells me to like, okay, this funny stuff in here, I actually know what this is. This is a specially custom defined JSON type called custom team. I know how to handle it when I'm pushing it in. I know how to handle it when I'm pulling it out. Or we actually tell me to how to handle it when I'm pushing it and how to handle it when I'm pulling it out. Uh, and that's, that's the purpose of this. So the first thing we tell it is, OK, this is how to serialize it. I, um, this is how to take the object and turn it into something that's uh, just JSONable that uh, Meteor can then handle and stick in Mongo. So normally, uh, it's, it would be pretty simple. Maybe I should hide this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that in a second, actually. So that's basically, um, I want to show you the player object first and then show how that builds up into the team. Um, so that's how to push it in, and then uh, you also then have to tell it how to get it out. So that's where you use this um, special eJSON object. You say, okay, me too. I'm adding in my own special eJSON type for you to be aware of. I'm calling it custom team, and I'm giving you a function, and that function tells you what to do once you pull it out of Mongo. Okay? Um, so what I've done to uh, try to take it to another level as well, I've done it um, not only for the team, but also uh, the player. So so if I add Rick into my team, okay. Um, I've now put a player in. Um, yeah. Let's do that. Okay. So now I've got two players in my team. You see it rolls up here and it rolls up here. Okay, so all that reactivity is happening. Um, so remember, this means that I've pushed it into the database and it's pulling it out. It's run that transform function. It's um, added the function onto it, and I've just called that in the front end. Okay. So that reactivity is happening nicely. I'm not having to uh, calculate anything on the front end. The model's done that all for me. Uh, I'll show you how that looks in the database now. So now I've got, because uh, I define custom player as an EJSON type as well, so I've got EJSON within EJSON. So I've got EJSON within EJSON within a transform. Okay. So I can reuse my player object anywhere as well. It doesn't have to be within a team. And I can reuse my team and players anywhere I want as well. So if I then look at players, so players uh, constructed pretty, pretty similar. Um, so again, Type is custom player, so this is so where I want to start. So the uh, the function you have to turn it into JSON to serialize it is basically pretty standard, right? That's how you normally write a bunch of JSON. Um, and then when you add the type, you basically tell it, okay, so uh, you'll be passed the value. So effectively, that's the property, the value of the property the meter is pulled out, and it will look like whatever you put in. Okay, so all the um, all the squiggly bits, right? They kind of go away, right? It kind of uses that as its own naming convention to uh, to store it, 
so that it knows when it pulls it out what's it going to look like. So uh, this will basically match the value that you're passed. So therefore you can basically you know, re-instantiate it doing whatever you've done. But just as we did with the transform function, I've also extended it here with a method that's very simplistic, right? Again, I'm not trying to do anything too complicated, that defines how to represent uh, someone's name. Because some people like to have their family name first, some people like me like to have it last. Uh, I didn't want to implement a method for Indian names because they're different by every state. Um, so yeah, so that's basically added it on there, and that's why when you see here, yeah, this representation is happening here. But if I look at again my HTML for that. For each player, I've, it's just called get full name. That's not a helper. I'm just calling the method on the JSON object. So, you know, if you, if you look at everything I've done, right, the, the helpers, all I do is, you know, these don't, these are just for selection thing for when I'm adding players, right? That's just pulling back a session variable. That's not doing any kind of uh, calculation here. The only thing I'm really doing is saying, just give me the data. But when I'm saying give me the data, I'm saying, Give me all the functions, give me my model, uh, give me all the JSON stuff all at the same time. Um, so the bit that I didn't show earlier then is when it comes to the team, right? So uh, because you can have eJSON within eJSON, you need to take that into account as well. Uh, it's kind of tripped me up first when serializing and deserializing it. Um, so in this instance, uh, for each of the players, because I know that's an eJSON object, I basically said, okay, so players, instead of just being, uh, you know, doing the forger saying players is players, I actually have to say, okay, I need to then um, take my player, turn that into an eJSON type before I wrap it up in the uh, in the higher level eJSON, and then again, you know, when I when I want to pull it out, okay, so. My, uh, my name, that's just straightforward. I pull that out exactly the same way I did before. But my players, I need to run each of my players through uh, the from, how to get it from JSON back into, into an object, okay? So that, so, okay, it's a little, so what's actually going on then is, I'm pulling out um, my document. On the way out of Mongo, Meteor is basically intercepting it and saying, oh, I can see you've got some uh, EJ, extended JSON, sorry, stand, sorry, some eJSON uh, here. So before I do anything, I need to then run that uh, eJSON function. So the first thing it'll pick up will actually be at the, at the team level. So when it's pulling the team out, it'll then say, okay, you've got players, this is, this is the value for players, uh, yeah, so that's where I'm taking the players. But I know, because I defined it, that actually players is itself an eJSON object. So I then need to uh, to map it back into an array and call the players eJSON, um, which is gonna go through here, so, uh, so it basically runs this, it runs the from JSON uh, for that player to give me my player back, and at the same time, putting this method onto it, so that in my team, I've now got an array of all my players, but instead of that just being uh, JSON documents with properties, that array I've just constructed is objects, okay? It's got, it's got methods on it, you saw it's got that full name method, right, that I can just, I can call like that, I've not had to do anything funky on the front end to make that happen. Um, so I've done that, and then having done that, um, when I return it as the team, the team itself has also had, um, like whether it's ready or not, uh, which is basically, do I have at least one player on my team? So that's had that method added on it. And then when it comes, so when it comes to the game, you're like, okay, so how's it, how's it got there from the game? And the answer is, well, because the transform function 
has actually put it into my game as well. Because even before Meteor's called the transform on the object, it's pulled out of Mongo. So it's pulled it out of Mongo, and it's already at that point run the EJSON to turn those properties into more fully fledged objects. So from a collection perspective, when I'm running the transform, I'm not actually passing it a typical document, I'm actually passing it uh, an object that's got properties and now methods as well, because that's coming through EJSON. So when I uh, create the new game and I extend it, so extend will uh, add to the new object all of the properties of the objects uh, that it's coming from. And at that stage, these JSONs already run, so it's also adding all of the methods. So I basically end up with this um, completely fully fledged object um, at a kind of several uh, levels of nesting um, that I then that I'm then throwing up to the front end, so that you know I can I can inspect uh, properties, I can run methods at the uh, at the game level, um, I can sorry, wrong table. Um, I can uh, look at properties of the, you know, within objects of objects, and then even down here, I've, you know, i have basically got an object within an object within an object, and I'm calling a function on it because I'm running an each and each and each, and uh, Meteor natively understands the data context each time of, of what I'm pushing. So, really, what I'm, you know, EJSON and uh, the transform function are incredibly powerful. Uh, it allows you to build this whole model, and uh, that's where the whole kind of isomorphic stuff really comes into play. Uh, it's talked about a lot with Meteor, and I didn't really understand what was the point early on because you do stuff in the back end, you do stuff in the front end. Uh, you might be using the same language, but you're not re really reusing much of it. The transform in the EJSON is where the reuse really, really starts to come into play. So. Any of the stuff on those objects, uh, the properties or the methods, I can call them on the back end, I can call them on the front end, they're all defined in one place. I just uh, stick them in, for me personally, in my models folder. I'm not sure you know, how the best way to structure a Meteor project is. I think that's a topic of ongoing debate. Um, but it's then available across the whole stack for me to use, um, as, you've, as you've seen here. Um, pretty simple. So just to, just to prove that. Get this ready. Um. Okay, so now two players are more, one in the other, and now it's ready to go. Um. Yeah, so. That's see JSON, that's transform. Uh, in summary, I think the transform is fantastic at the document level, modeling those objects, and JSON allows you to uh, make proper models out of your properties. And that's one of the reasons why I now really like just how awesome in Meteor is and why isomorphic code actually makes sense as opposed to just happening to have the same language on both the front end and the back end. And that's me. Any questions? Yeah, so uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, most of the transformation uh, are used in the front end. Right? All the object transformations were used in the front end. Yeah, the bit I don't know is um, whether the transform is, because I, I don't know Meteor's internal work. So I don't know if it's sending an object over the wire, because I think right. Meteor says it's data over the wire, so I presume that having that um, isomorphism means that actually the, uh, the transform is applied on the front end when it pulls it out of Minimongo, because mm -hmm. Minimongo is already replicated with the back end. Console. Sorry? You can check that in the JavaScript console, so you can go to your app uh, um, on the page, you can just find the command on the Minimongo client side database and see if it's actually storing the object model. And actually interrogate the mini Mongo itself on the client side. Yeah, yeah, in the JavaScript console. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, in fact, you didn't try it now. I've not. I've never. Uh, I've never tried interrogating it. So I don't know. What's the? Uh, it's a collection name. Just do collection. Collection is dot find. Yeah. So the killer. Uh, but the but the find you already know that it's been turned into the object by the time you pull it out. <coughs> so you, you from a front end perspective, yes, you're dealing with it as an object. What I'm saying is I'm not sure where oh, I see. where in the process it's all happened. So basically my understanding with feature collection is that uh, it's both defined on the server and on the client, right? So the transform function, if if the if Meacher receives the data from the Mongo, maybe it all it runs the, the transform function in the server, right? I don't know. So I don't know if it's running. I, I don't know if it's running the transform on the server before it passes the data to the mini Mongo. Or if it's just passing the data to the mini Mongo and the front end is running the transform as it pulls it out to mini Mongo to objectify it for the client. I suspect that's what's happening, but I don't know. But it might have to be in the server if you're interrogating the object. Well, because it, it's isomorphic. Server. So although you've written the model once, uh, Meteor's made it available yeah, to both the front end and the back end. So when you call games.find on the front end, it pulls it out of mini Mongo. But when you pull call games.find on the back end, it pulls it out of the proper MongoDB. You know, if you're calling it within a method. But how would it send out send a object from server to client? That's why I assume it must be doing it on the mini Mongo side. I was meter I would be just sending the Mongo uh, JSON data to the to the to the client because that would be more faster yeah. than so, so I'm assuming this uh, objectification yeah. happens out of the well, mini Mongo into the client, I'm and assuming. Then, but so I may be wrong because Meteor's using DDP. Uh, it's using its own protocol. It's not It's not using standard JSON. But on your server side, you heard, aren't you using the, your new methods? So would that have to happen on the server as well? Yeah, so the, the whole thing with Meteor's kind of lost some morphism. I mean, for example, the even at the simplest level, right, when you define the collection, you know, even without a transform, you know, normally you've you've defined you've defined them in one place, but actually that's available on both the front end and the back end, even if you define it without a transform. Yeah, so, so my point is that if you have that running on both back end and front end, and you only need it on the front end, why do you need to transform the data in the back end? Back end. So, right. Well, so why not yep. just transform so, the data so, uh, when, when you have the JSON data on the front end? Yeah, um, if, you, if you really wanted to, uh, Meteor does allow you to differentiate whether it's Meteor as client or Meteor as server. So in theory, you could do that within the transform. If you wanted to say, I only do this much on the client, do this much on the back end, if you really wanted to. Yeah, or you can um, also but, but do part of the template thing. But the you can call in console log inside the transform. Yeah. yeah. So my, my assumption is it's actually running on both. Yeah. Yeah, it's isomorphic, so when it pulls it out of MongoDB on the back end, it'll run it to the transform. When it pulls it out of mini Mongo on the front end, it'll also run it to the transform. Um, again, again, the whole point with some of that sort of isomorphic stuff is, you know, for example, on the front end I can say, is the game ready? Right. So if on the front end I click, you know, game start, and it makes that method call to the back end to start. The back end can do a sanity check to make sure that someone's not fiddling with the front end, and also call exactly the same method on the same object. Say, before I start this game, is it actually ready? Yeah. And although, to all intents and purposes, it almost looks like it's calling it on the same object, it's not calling it on the same object. So what you would have actually done is just taken the game ID, you'd have gone to Mongo, said, okay, let me pull that game out, it's run through the transform function again, so that means that method, that method of call is available to it. Now let me check it against my kind of uh, back-end verified true and certain copy of the object that hasn't been fiddled with by the client. 
so again, that's where some of that isomorphism comes into play. Um, you can you can basically utilize exactly the same uh, sort of uh, methods, uh, functions, whether they be sanitization checks or whether they actually do stuff on the front end and the back end. But on the back end, they're running off of the back end data stuff, and on the front end, they're running off the mini Mongo. So even if someone fiddles about with all the methods on the front end, you you know that the ones on the back end are still safe and sound, the ones you define. Which is a really cool, but hard to get your head around. Sorry, I can't. Isn't the filter by the players names? Yes. Because it's also the key. Yeah, I've. So that, that, that's a good point. Um, when I've tried to um, apply some of the. Uh, like a filter to a publication, um, I've got into difficulty when I've tried to do that on. Uh, whatever properties I've made in JSONable. Yeah. And I'm not sure whether that's a bug or a feature. Because in theory, you know, Meteor should be intercepting that and say, look, I know you've defined this as a JSON, so I'm going to kind of convert the query to search for that as an JSON object. But from what I've seen, uh, and I, I, I looked at that about a month ago and it didn't seem to be working. May, it may have been addressed by now, it may be just my bad code. Because, yeah, certainly you wouldn't want to have to uh, define the query to utilize the EJSON naming convention because you wouldn't expect any guarantee that that naming convention would be consistent between releases. I think that that should be the reason why you should not convert on server side. The object upon when using in the front end. So no, okay. that's so that the but the EJSON affects how it's actually stored, right? So it's it's been wow. stored within within the Mongo using that naming right. convention. Yeah. So how much of this was? I, I think I'm I'm stressing on uh, maybe what's purely incidental to this, but so as, as far as this goes, was this uh, data structure that you've got? For that was really just for the illustration of eJSON, or would you actually like, recommend doing data structures like this in documents? Because yeah, so that I, I think me um, all kinds of yeah. ancillary. So, so, the way, so the way I see JSON is um, it's it makes most sense to uh, to use eJSON when you've got a component of your model that is being reused across different collections. So, um, yeah, yeah Mongo, Mongo is not a relational data store, right? So, um, but if you think of it in terms of uh, RDBMS terms, if you've got a kind of a common definition that would need to be shared across multiple tables, in Mongo the same thing can happen. You might have a common definition that needs to be shared across multiple collections. So each document basically refers to the same master copy. That's really where uh, I think eJSON comes into its own and has its strengths because it allows you to do just that. In this particular example, um, if, I, um, if I'm only using it within a single collection, and that's why I use the example like, what if I have a game of chess, what if I have a game of Go? Um, if I'm only using it within a single collection, I can pretty much do everything I just did with eJSON through using the transform function. But then I'm not storing it, I don't have all this funky eJSON stuff in my back end. But there's nothing to stop me running like, as I pull the data out, uh, just running a map function on the array and objectifying it that way before I, uh, before I pull it out. So all of that can be done using the transform function. So eJSON is really best used, I, I believe, you know, the Meteor team may tell me I'm wrong. Um, if you have a particular custom data type that you want to reuse across multiple collections. I'm not sure I've wrapped my hand up yet. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I may 
maybe if you've got a, uh, very simple. so say you've got a collection of sales documents and you've got a collection of uh, purchase documents, um, but you know that there are some people who you buy from and the, you also sell to the same people. So within each document, you might want to define a, uh, a business partner. Okay? And you want to make sure that that business partner is exactly the same in your sales orders as it is in your purchase orders. So you can define business partner as any JSON object. So that when it gets pulled out from the sales orders, it's got exactly the same methods and setup as if it had been pulled out of purchase orders. So you, by doing that, you, you've defined that in JSON once, you've not repeated yourself, you've not redefined the transformation process twice within the same set of documents for what is effectively the same object. I, I, it's one of those ones where I think the more, the more complex your models get, the more, uh, uh, the more useful it becomes. If you're dealing with uh, fairly simplistic single collections where or, or even a set of collections where they're, they're completely segregated, there's nothing common between them, you probably don't need to use eJSON because you can just take your transform and you know, extend and extend and extend and extend you know, uh, as much as you want, uh, two properties, two sub-properties, etc. Any last questions? Or oh, yeah, oh, you can argue with me later about any of the stuff I've got wrong. Like I said, the first time I've done a technical talk in about a decade, so uh, it's, uh, hopefully it wasn't too good.